Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So, guys, delving deep into our hidden history, that's the thing that is the most interesting thing for me personally. So, when we're looking at it, what are some of the world's oldest writings? And because perhaps these will have the most authentic tales, because so many tales have been retold and retold and retold again. And when we look at it, we see obviously the Sumerian tablets. Those go back well over 5,000 years. So again, keeping in mind the age of, say, for instance, the biblical writings that we have, uh, the oldest biblical te texts that we actually have, we have fragments. And th the oldest ones are Dead Sea Scrolls, which were basically found between 47 and 56, 1947, 1956. And we have some fragments that go back to 250 BC. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest complete Old Testament manuscript was the Leningrad Codex, which dates to 1008 AD, AD, you know, only a uh, 1,000 years ago. So that's not very, very old. And everything that we have biblical is really just a retelling of something much, much older. So when we look at the other ancient texts and the writings that we have, we see the writings from the Indus Valley go back to the 33rd century BC, so 5,300 years ago. And the Egyptian papyruses as well go back about 5,000 years. Very, very ancient writings. So... The Sumerian Kings List, and this is just an interesting thing. We have discovered almost, almost half a million or so cuneiform writing texts. Amazing number, you know, 500,000 different uh, writings that have been discovered, and their discoveries go back to, to 1500 A.D., when we first started to, to find them and uncover them. And they didn't even know what they were. They thought they might even be just artwork. They didn't realize it was really a language at first. But we discovered the Rosetta Stone to, to translate them in the middle of the 19th century, well before Zechariah Sitchin and, and you know the like had done any translating. So many, many, many different scholars have translated these texts, and they are consistent in their translations for the most part. So the Sumerian Kings list is just fascinating, and this list begins 266,000 years ago, long before we understood human civilization to even had begun at a time when kingship first descended from heaven. So there is your clue. Kingship, again, is given to humans from above, from the heavens. And it's the gods that bring kingship to the earth. And original kings were the gods. And then they became what we would call the demigods, the ones that are of mixed blood. And when you get down to it, if, if these stories are true, we're all basically demigods in a, in a sense that we all have DNA coming from these beings that came from the heavens. So really fascinating to look at this. And there's all sorts of rulers named there. So you have the pre-flood or antediluvian kings on the list who reigned for tens of thousands of years. Tens of thousands of years. So, you know, some have taken that to be the, the fact of that is that these beings were more God, quote unquote, like than necessarily human. Perhaps their DNA was different. Perhaps, you know, human DNA at that time was of a different sort or perhaps not of a, a limited sort. As when we look back to the Bible and we look at Genesis 3.22, and you know, let's bring that up for you guys just so you could read it, because this is a big one that everybody's talking about now for many reasons. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. 
And now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Can't have that. So, was our DNA changed, altered? Did humans live a much longer life? If we look at the biblical stories, we see Methuselah lived 969 years, and he's not the only one. There are many of them, many of the quote unquote uh, patriarchs that lived hundreds of years. And it's interesting to note that there's other cultures around the world that say the same thing. So, these pre-flood antediluvian kings reigned for tens of thousands of years. These were measured in units called SARS, NERS, and SASs, or 3,600 years, 600 years, and 60. Everything is basically based on the six when you get to the Sumerian uh, system. Uh, in total, these eight antediluvial, antediluvial kings ruled for 241,200 years. That's long, a real long time period for eight individuals. Are we to take it symbolically? Are we to take it literally? What do you guys think? Could it be that these were not homo sapiens sapiens? Or could it be that things were different in those days? Or is this just allegory and stories? It's interesting to look at this. These epochs measure in tens of thousands of years, and they're reminiscent of the Hindu yugas during which years of peace chaos and everything in between are represented by cyclical ages lasting hundreds of thousands of years the longest reign of the sumerian king en men la uana lasted for 43,200 years which is oddly similar to the kali yuga lasting 432,000 years now 432 is an auspicious number in mysticism and many other cultures, including the Vikings, the Greeks, and the Mayans, but it's not necessarily a given that everybody agrees the Kali Yuga is 432,000 years either, so we have to look at that as well. But this is fascinating. Now, the other fascinating part is after the flood, the list says kingship descended from heaven in a new city called Kish. So again, when the flood came, according to the uh, Sumerian stories, the Anunnaki left the earth because they knew it was coming. And in fact, Enlil thought mankind wasn't worth it anymore. And Enlil is the god that ruled from the sky. And Enki wanted to save somebody. So thus we have Upanisham, or we could look at the text of Gilgamesh, or we could you know, equate it to the biblical Noah who is saved by the god Enki, Ea. And, you know, we have humanity make it through, which really ticked off Enlil, the god uh, of the sky. So, if we look at the Sumerian story, the Anunnaki, those that came from the heavens, um, knew that this was coming. And at least some of them just wanted mankind to be over with and didn't want to deal with mankind anymore. So they allowed the event to happen, the big worldwide flood. And it's interesting to note that after the flood, kingship descended from heaven again. So the Anunnaki left, and then they came back down. Uh, and it descended in a new city called Kish, which is now in central Iraq. There, post-Diluvian kings reigned for hundreds of years. So we have one here ruling for 670 years, another one for 900 years. These supposed multi-century lifespans reflect similar reports of men in the Old Testament, such as we know, Methuselah, Enoch, and others. Could there be a connection? It seems like that would be a likely thing to draw, is you know that there is something here. There is perhaps some sort of truth here. And if you look at the creation story itself, the biblical creation story, at first man's put in the garden and told to eat the fruit uh, of the trees. And that was to be the food, and the leaves were to be his medicine. After the fall, the disobedience to the gods by eating of a tree that we were not supposed to eat. And that's what original sin comes from is that we're not obeying the quote-unquote Anunnaki gods, uh, then basically we're told to take dominion over the earth and to subjugate everything and kind of act like they do, not any longer necessarily being in, in harmony, but using and abusing the animals and, 
you know, just that's when we also have uh, the whole system of burnt sacrifices coming after the fall again. So it's interesting to see all this. So the lifespans start to decrease. And again, we go back to Genesis 3.22, and you go farther in, it says that basically God says that man, man's lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So, you know, does that have anything to do, again, as I've mentioned before, with the fused chromosome number two that we have that nobody else has on the planet, no other creatures? And... Uh, you know, it's just a curious, interesting thing to see. So the post-Diluvian list includes 23 kings who rule for a total of 24,510 years, three months and three and a half days. After this period of rule, kingship was then moved to Iana, followed by Uruk, and then Ur, and Ur of the Chaldees is where Abram comes from. And again, Abram, you know, again, all the biblical stories come from much older sources. Curious, too, that Abram becomes Abraham, and if we look at his wife, Sarai becomes Sarah, and we look at, say, the trinity of Hindu gods, you have uh, Brahma, which is very similar, and Sarai, Svati. So it's curious, and we could, of course, go into Israel. You know, Israel is Ra-El, El, the Canaanite god, chief Canaanite god. And uh, is could represent Isis for one, uh, and then Avra is the sun god, and of course we have Amen and Amun. There's so much that has been taken from the older stuff, and when we recognize that the biblical perspective is a very, very limited perspective that has been rewritten time and time and time again, as uh, I've quoted before, in some books there's been hundreds of redactions and edits. So it's interesting when we look into this, and lifespans decrease. And then, of course, we have Gilgamesh, which, you know, the Gilgamesh story is one of the sources of um, the Noah story, and it's far, far older. You know, and Gilgamesh is thought to have ruled between 2800-2500 BCE. When we're talking about the oldest fragments of the Old Testament that we have, just fragments, perhaps is from about 200 B.C., comparing it to basically writings that go 2,000 plus years before that and also give us much more detail as well. So this is just fascinating. Until recently, it was believed all human DNA could be traced to a common ancestor in Africa between 60 and 140,000 years ago. Uh, the Adam, and then if you read uh, the Sumerian epics, it's Adama, and it's obvious that's where everything is coming from. It's all coming from the Sumerian uh, tablets, again, of which the sheer volume of them dwarfs and predates anything biblical by thousands of years, and, and the volume of the works, is it just dwarfs it as well. So Demuzid, Demuzid, also known as Tammuz later on, is a Mesopotamian god associated with shepherds, who was the primary consort of the goddess Inanna, uh, also known as Ishtar. And in Sumerian mythology, Tammuz's sister was Geshit Tanana, the goddess of agriculture, fertility. But Tammuz is interesting because, again, he is known as the shepherd, the shepherd of men. And, you know, again, this is very old. This is going thousands of years prior to anything biblical. And um, in Inanna's descent into the underworld, Dezumid fails to mourn Inanna's death. And when she returns from the underworld, she allows the Gala demons to drag him down to the underworld as her replacement. So here we have kind of like a dying, resurrecting God. And you could see where this, the stories here are not exactly the same, but very similar to Isis and Osiris as Osiris goes into the underworld as well. Inanna later regrets this decision and decrees that Demuzid will spend half the year in the underworld and the other half the year with her, while his sister Gesh Geshetanana stays in the underworld in his place, thus resulting in the cycle of the seasons. So, you know, it, it's interesting to see how there's so many similarities in the mythologies when we go and look at them. And this is a detailed going through the full king's list again. And this is the big thing. After the kingship descended from 
heaven. And it came to Eridug. And so it goes through the whole list with how, how long they ruled, like 28,800 years. Do you think people really ruled that long, or was these some other types of beings? Is it a coincidence that all the wars that have gone on in Iraq, this is the whole area that we're talking about. This is exactly where we're talking about. And so is part of the thing with the wars going on is the destruction of evidence after kingship descended from the heavens right interesting it's it's all so fascinating and here's some more info on the king's list and reinvestigating the antediluvian sumerian king's lists so this is this is very well documented nine things you may not know about the ancient sumerians one of the cities had about 80,000 residents i think they're underestimating too the sizes of some of these population hubs um the list of Sumerian rulers included one woman. Yes, there was a woman uh, queen, basically a monarch, a female monarch as well. Very little is known about her reign. Now, this makes a big statement. The Sumerian city-states were often at war with one another. And in fact, you know, there was almost a constant state of war going on between the city-states. Each one of the city-states were ruled by their own god their own Anunnaki, their own heavenly being, who at first resided in his own temple. And, you know, and later on, when kingship was passed from the heavens, from the gods, and given to man, when the gods pulled back, apparently, then it was, it was the God-appointed ruler, the, the king, the monarch, uh, that ruled. So, and they were always at odds with each other, always at war, which is what we see to this day. The Sumerians were famously fond of beer. Well, okay. Cuneiform writing was used for over 3,000 years during their times. They were well-traveled merchants as well. And uh, the hero of the Epic of Gilgamesh probably was a real Sumerian historical figure. And you see him holding a lion here. This is supposed to be a full-grown lion. So how big is this guy? How powerful is he to hold a lion like a little kitty cat? Right? Sumerian mathematics and measurements are still used to this day. Sumerian culture was lost to history until the 19th century. Think about how much we didn't know. And when we were looking at the cliff note version that we have in the Bible, which is pulled from the Sumerians, also from Egypt as well. We're not getting the whole story at all. So then when we look at Genesis over here, and we see the Tower of Babel, then it makes very sense, very good sense. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language. So, and the Lord said, if look at the people, they are all one. They're all unified. And let's jump back to 11.6. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the sons of men were building. And the Lord said, If they have begun to do this as one people speaking the same language, then nothing they devise will be beyond them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. And the Lord, uh, okay, okay. And so the Lord scattered them from there all over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. So mankind was divided. And this is, you know, probably about when, right after, then we have Deuteronomy 32.8. And this is when uh, God basically divides mankind according to the number of the sons of God, or the sons of the gods. And so this gets into how it was rewritten textually to become the sons, number of the sons of Israel. And this is a rewrite. This is another one of basically the case where they're trying to hide the fact that it was recognized that there was more than one God, quote unquote, at play here. More than one heavenly being, more than one Anunnaki is really what it breaks down to. And so, you know, the, as it says right here, the last phrase, according to the number of the sons of Israel, reflects the reading of the Masoretic texts. And, and these Masoretic texts are constantly rewritten by the Masoretes, who are the scribes, who basically are, are given license to go ahead and change things as it goes. And so when we've gotten older texts, which actually translate 
to either the angels or the messengers of the gods or the sons of the gods. These are the older texts that are clarifying that things have been revised in such a way to make us think uh, that the God of Israel is just a singular God. But the reality is this is all referring to the Anunnaki. And it, it's interesting to see that, yet it doesn't mean that these gods, any of them, <clears throat> are, quote-unquote, prime creator source or the real singular source of all that there is. Because they're not, these are just beings. These, these are beings like us. And in fact, we are you know, apparently the offspring of these beings, at least partly genetically, with the genetic manipulation that has gone on. And so it, it's interesting to look at all this and to see, as we had said before, the oldest uh, partial writings we have that are biblical are approximately from about 200, 250 BC at the very earliest. Otherwise, you're looking at 1008 AD for the Leningrad Codex, which is the first earliest complete Old Testament manuscript that we have. So when we look and recognize that, then we recognize that what we're looking at on these Sumerian tablets are by far closer to the reality than, than anything else that we have as Sassy uh, gets wound up by that. So, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the system that we have in effect is the S Sumerian system. That is the system that is in effect right now. And so... It's very interesting to, to, to look at this. And when we look at it, what was the purpose of the king, the Sumerian king? It was to make sure that the will of the gods was being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the purpose of the kingship. And that is what's still going on. So it, 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 in my mind, I just wonder which of the Sumerian gods are, have been in control. Uh, you know, at some point, Marduk seems to have taken control of the planet. And then so many things that were attributed to uh, Enlil and en Enki originally get attributed to Marduk, including actually uh, the, the name of... Um, the planet Nibiru being called Marduk as well. So it's really, really fascinating to look. But again, the purpose was to make sure that what the king did was carry out the will of the gods. So the will of, you know, <laughs> basically making sure that what's done on earth is the will of the heavens, so to speak. So the most powerful man in the world, is it the black pope? So this is, again, just getting into the fact that this is all intertwined and intertied. Whether or not you are Catholic or, or Christian or Islam, and again, Islam means to submit, to submit to the will of God. The will of who? Well, you know, the, and, well, if we look at the crescent, then we would take for the symbol uh, to indicate that m perhaps it's the god Sin, the moon god Sin, again from the Sumerian pantheon. And many have interpreted Allah to be the god Sin from the Sumerian pantheon. But again, Enlil is really a title as well, because it, it, it means, you know, Lord of the Sky. And Ki is also a title, Lord of the Earth. So perhaps it's a, an office of sorts that's assumed by different beings and Eya, Eya is the original N key. So it's, it's interesting to see that. And so this, this gentleman is, according to some, the most powerful man on earth who ruled over maritime laws. And many of you guys recognize we're controlled by maritime law, British maritime law. It's the system that we have. Controls the banking system, Freemasonry, uh, secret services, etc., the Vatican owns 60% of all Israel lands and the lands of the Temple Mount for their third Solomon Temple, where they want their throne. So everybody has their own agenda. And I think, in, in my mind, yeah, everybody is at a different place in their realization of uncovering all the things that are so deeply, deeply covered. covered. And so, you know, who really is Satan? Well, Satan just simply means adversary. So, you know, the adversary 
of the world system, well, if he's the adversary of the world system, it might actually be a good being because <laughs> the world system is governed by these dark beings, and that's very, very obvious. So well, one of the things that we see is light is dark, dark is light. You know, accepting and wanting blood sacrifice, just taking a look at that particular piece of the Bible when we look at Cain and Abel, and the blood sacrifice is accepted instead of the sacrifice of fruits and grains and things of that sort. That That's your first clue. Something is wrong here. Uh, something's wrong with the entire system. And, you know, there it's a control grid that goes strongly through our religious belief system, as well as, obviously, the political ones as well. So, you know, this is very, very interesting stuff, and I don't always agree with everything. And, in fact, I find rarely there's anything I agree with totally. Uh, I think that we all have little bits and pieces of the bigger picture, and that bigger picture is always still unfurling. It's still unraveling as we go. And I almost think at times that they want us to look at things as being... Um, you know, different than they are, in, at, to say the least. And before I end this one, let me get Cindy's take on what we've been talking about. I'm so fascinated with hidden history because I think if we only knew where we're from, we would know more about where we're going. Um, it's all sort of kind of a mixed bag of this and this and that, and I think we need to use our discernment most of all. Definitely. So if we look at what's the original purpose of man according to the Sumerian tablets, well, man was basically created to be a slave for the gods. And so if you look at it from a biblical perspective, you know, if you look at the Old Testament way and, and, and the day of the Lord, what happens? And, you know, you see God comes back to rule earth over humans directly. So is that really, is it, I mean, it hit me 30 years ago that, you know, what they were talking about was basically the the ancient gods returning and a total control grid pl placed down upon the earth where, you know, the Anunnaki will rule out in the open directly once again. And, you know, even if you go into Revelation and you see the cube coming out of the sky and landing on the earth, and what's the bottom line? Well, Let's, let's go look at the end of Revelation, which, oddly enough, is chapter 22. So, you know, it, it talks about God and the Lamb. And again, you know, who is the shepherd? Well, in the Sumerian, it's Demuzi, and we could all look into this in different ways. Um, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night, no candle, no light of day. And it goes, it goes on talking about God dwelling right here amongst us, in front of us, and we could actually see his face. Can we see the face of the creator of everything? You know, yeah, can we see source really? Yeah, how could you see source? And it, it, it's interesting because when you, when you look at this and you really, you know, tear into this, you, you see, you know, God is here dwelling amongst us, and it's, it's just fascinating to see it. it's just like in the old days. This, this is. This is the old days. This is a return to the Sumerian gods, the Anunnaki being here with us. The new heaven and the new earth and the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So you have a giant mothership coming and landing is what it sounds like. We could see that so easy and true. What's, what's interesting also, which is, is quoted, is that if anybody misbehaves, and, and there's a lot of Old Testament quotes about that as well, then God will shut off the rain to their land, you know, if, if anybody misbehaves or sins in any, any way, shape, or form. Uh, so, you know, God will control everything. So we could see, to me, everything in a biblical perspective, it's still coming out of that Sumerian perspective. And this is still all about... Uh, basically the direct control of the gods here on earth. 
And, you know, which God that is, you know, it's, it's everybody's guess. You could do the research. Is it Enlil? Is it Enki? Is it Ningashida? Uh, are we talking Marduk? Are we talking Sin? You know, which, which one uh, or someone that we don't even know? But see, there's, there's different layers to this, too, because there is truth, you know, because ultimately there is one source of everything. And so in that sense, you know, what monotheism is pointing towards is correct in a sense. But also when we look at it from all the religions, traditions, truths that were taught to us um, by the beings that this Anunnaki group doesn't want, uh, teaching us and which is given to us through the mystery traditions is that you know God true source is in every single one of us it's in them too as well as being in us and um, you know being in all the living creatures so sources in everything and and that's what we find uh, coming out of the Vedic tradition uh, coming out of so many of the Eastern traditions is that source is in everything and everyone and so, you know, like when we look at the Mahabharata and Krishna is talking to Arjuna, he says, the only difference between you and me is the fact that I remember my past lives and you don't. And so, you know, and he also knows that source is alive within him. And there's a transfiguration there, which is very similar to what you see come out of the Bible. And, you know, Krishna and Christ the, the linguistics on it, very, very similar. And, and Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu, who is the preserver. So there's many layers to this, you know, and Christ consciousness is something that is, is very real and something that we need to attain, which is living out of the heart center and seeing the unity in all things. What's happened is that our, our systems are so ingrained with half-truths and incomplete uh, realities and it's been so twisted that it, it makes it almost impossible unless we spend decades and decades pouring through all this and also going within so that we have that realization that comes from within. And the Gnostics were persecuted for a reason. And in and, and Gnosticism, it's all about gnosis. It's a knowing that can only come from realizing something, experiencing something. It's nothing you could learn left-brained analytically. It's nothing that you are simply told is the truth and say, okay, I'm choosing to believe that. No, that doesn't work either. You have to know it. You have to have uh, an experience. You, it, it's experiential. It's not learned. It's experiential. That's the difference. So the Gnostics had a totally different type of Christianity, and they were persecuted unto death, and all their works were burned and destroyed. But thankfully, we found some of those too, and we've uncovered uh, things like knowledge of the Demiurge, and, you know, I know I'm going really long on this and it's kind of everywhere, but there's so much to this and there's such a huge, huge puzzle here. So, you know, what ultimately is the outcome of the Bible? Well, it's it's the return of God, apostrophe S, apostrophe, you know, God's ruling directly over us here on earth. And uh, it's return to the Sumerian times, a, re a return to the, you know, king's list, perhaps, that we started out with, where the gods were here, right amongst us, and ruling over us, and living tens of thousands of years, if not more. So it's all fascinating, my friends. I know there'll be a lot of people that totally disagree with this, but hey, you know, it, it's still supposedly a free country to a degree. So, you know, go ahead and disagree. And maybe some people will actually look deeper. And maybe some people will have aha moments as well. So as always, my friends, thank you for your support on Patreon and Ko-Fi. God bless and namaste.